National Book Fair. And welcome to our session on nomads and covering the wellspring of the United Arab Emirates. I'm here with Zaki Nusebi and I, who are um, interviewing and talking and conversing with our guest of honor, writer Anthony Satin, and his book, 2022 Nomads. Zaki and I, earlier last week, had a conversation together. Uh, and then earlier today, Anthony and I met and began to converse um, about the topic of nomads and particularly about his book. And we'd like to invite you to come and engage with us on this conversation as well. Uh, a conversation that uh, the three of us, I think, have become uh, good friends over this topic of nomads. So Anthony, uh, we'll start first with uh, the question about the book itself. Tell us about your book. What inspired you to write this book? Oh, okay, uh, do I have a sound? Yes. Uh, this is the book. It's, it's called Nomads, which speaks for itself. And it's, the subtitle is The Wanderers Who Shaped Our World. And, uh, and it's a, a history of the last 12,000 years told from the point of view of nomadic people. Um, and it, 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 all books come from many, many different sources, the idea, the inspiration. But one of the reasons I wrote this book is because of a, a phrase, a description of history that came from an Oxford and Princeton professor, Felipe Fernandez Armesto, who described history as a path picked through ruins. And it's a beautiful image, you know, this, this lovely path with forest on either side, perhaps, and in the middle are these ruined buildings. Now, if you're a nomad, the only role you have in this version of history is as somebody who destroys things, because nomads tend not to build monuments. And therefore, nomads are not in the Western histories. And, and then they, you know, I, I studied history uh, at school, and at no point did anybody mention a nomad, apart from Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, and Temelane, and they are presented as the world's great killers. And if you, if you spend time in, in, in this part of the world, uh, as I have done, or particularly in, in Egypt and, and, and the Middle East, you know, the, that's just not true. This is n does not reflect the reality of things. And so I thought, rather foolishly, well, I'll write an, another sort of history, a history that actually includes nomads and shows what some of what nomads have brought to, to the world and helped shape the world that we know it, because it's simply not in our history books. And um, well, I'm not, I'm not an academic, I'm a storyteller. Um, I've written a wide range of, of different things. I started out writing fiction. Um, the book I wrote before this was a biography. But it's always about telling stories. And so what I wanted to do with this book was to string a whole lot of stories together over this 12,000 year period that, um, that link up the nomadic contribution, or some of it, to events that we think we know and present them in a different way. Yeah, I, I think what struck me about the book is um, that it is a history book in many respects, a world history, a global history book, right? But also done through the lens of a travel writer where you, almost like a time traveler, you sort of go in and go out and you, you visit with people, uh, you ethnographically get yourself involved in their lives and then you reflect on history as a whole in the process. And so it's a, it's a, a wonderful ability you have in the book um, to bring your reader along on the travel with you. Um, there's a section in the book, for example, um, in the beginning where you write, Every there, everywhere there was beauty. If I were a photographer, this is page two, if I were a photographer, I would have captured the shifting shadows and the slanting sunbeams of afternoon as they tinted the snow mountains pink and cast gold across the surface of the stream. Uh, and then you can continue with these wonderful memories. Um, perhaps you'd like to read a section from the book in that in, uh, yeah, in the if, beginning yeah, where we, you where you take time. your reader you take us to the Zagros sure. mountains I mean I would just say you know I, I, I love writing I mean writing is the moment in, in my life when I'm most fully alive but I also love traveling and that's you know that's the fun part you know, and so obviously to to write a book like this it was too good an opportunity I had to go I had to go places so this I went to Iran where there's this tribe called the Bakhtiari who uh, who claimed to have been moving up and down the Zagros Mountains for at least 2,000 years. Um, but the reason, which they might 
probably isn't true. Um, but what is true is that 100 years ago, the filmmakers who made the first King Kong in the 1920s, the first film they made was about the migration of the Bakhtiari. And uh, I saw this film, and I thought, well, okay, that's how they did it 100 years ago. And today, they're still, do it, still traveling you know, the, the same journey. They have the same life. Um, 100 years ago, there were 50,000 people doing this migration from this tribe with half a million animals. I mean, the numbers are, are much reduced now, but they are still doing it. So anyway, this is, this is me up, up the mountains waiting for them to come at the end of their migration. A young man walks towards me with a stick slung across his shoulders and a flock at his feet. The sheep in front, beside, and behind him are as chaotic as meltwater in the nearby stream and they carry him down the path like a crowd of rowdy children. An older man follows, weather-worn but still strong, a rifle over his left shoulder. He clicks his tongue to encourage them forward. Behind him are two women on donkeys, one older than the other, and they again, I guess they are his wife and daughter. They look strong women, but then it's a tough life beneath the shard peaks of the Zagros Mountains. Other donkeys carry their belongings bundled inside heavy rust and brown cloth that the women have woven and will soon repurpose as door flaps when the tents are set up. There are a few shrubs, a few trees at this altitude, but the snow has melted and there is intense beauty and excellent grazing in the valley blanketed with irises, dwarf tulips and other spring flowers. The family is smiling as they lead their sheep and grey and white goats along the rock-strewn track towards me, the bucks sporting majestic swept back horns, and I am smiling with them, swept up by the excitement of the Bakhtiari tribe's annual migration from the plains into the mountains in search of summer pasture. Everywhere there was beauty. If I, if I was a ph photographer, I would have captured the shifting shadows and slanting sunbeams of the afternoon as they tinted the snow mountains pink and cast gold across the surface of the stream. If I were a composer, I would have harmonized the rumble of water with the clunk of stones shifting across the riverbed, the buzzing of bees, the clanking of bells, and the whistling and whooping of men bringing the flocks in for the night. There was beauty in all. But I'm a writer, and barefoot and slightly sunstruck, I pull out a pencil to note the pure quality of light in the blue sky the way that colors, especially yellows, popped in the green valley, and the sudden chill that descended as soon as the sun dropped behind the crest. Late that night, the nomad's tents glowed like embers across the river. The moon shone full above the mountain ridge, and I fell asleep wondering how Lord Byron had known that not vainly did the early Persian make his altar the high places and the peak, there to seek the spirit. My spirits were soaring in that high place. Uh, Anthony, I would like to come in and ask you the question, my, a question myself on this. You have just given us a wonderful description, a personal story, anecdote, that is mixed with the general history. But what I want to know is when you go somewhere, like you did in Persepolis, and you see Cyrus with his statement, I have gone to Scythia and I destroyed them. And, and made them uh, subject to me. And then you see next to that uh, a figure where a Scythian lord is wearing, is in there with his sword. And you say, ah, this history can't be true because they wouldn't have let that uh, Scythian lord come into the assembly of the king if he had been defeated. Or you are quoting Gibbons and you say, he is talking about the Attila and uh, quoting uh, an earlier writer who, who said he was objective. And you say, ah, but Gibbons must, has never read that author because if you read him, you would have seen that he was so utterly uh, prejudiced again. So when you discover new historical facts while traveling around these places, what do you do? Do you say suddenly, ah, I am, I am, I am, I want to, I, I have done a discovery, I want to write about it, I want the people to find more about it. Well, well, yes, that's exactly what I do. I mean, and the, uh, 
well, we were, I was talking about, and I've often talked to academics, who, professors who sit in lovely, lovely chairs, um, how jealous I am of them, because it seems like such a charmed life. But, but one of the things about being me, ra rather than William, is I, I don't have to answer to anybody. I can take this, and I can take that, and I can make these, this connection, and, and say, this is what it seems to me. And, and from my, you know, from my own position, but I don't have a, an academic reputation that I have to worry about. I'm a storyteller, and, and, I, uh, and if I find things that, that work, that, um, and if I can make connections, then I'll make them. And, and I would say, I mean, we're living through the most wonderful time of writing about history. Um, you know, it, because everything is being reimagined, in, because of decolonialization, because of feminism, because of, of Black Lives Matter, you know, things that, now everything is, is open to question. And, and it seems like a very, very good time to be, to be doing, writing this sort of writing and to be doing this sort of work, to, to question, you know, well, why do we think that? And, and obviously the more you dig, I mean, you mentioned about the Scythians in, in, at Persepolis with the Persians. I mean, it, this is such a wonderful topic. And, and you know, the, the British Museum had an exhibition about Scythians about five years ago. And, and everybody, it was a major exhibition and everybody said, who the hell are the Scythians? I mean, nobody had ever heard of them before. And, um, and I sat through three days of conference there because I was writing about them in, for my book. And at the end of it, it's like, well, what do we really know about the Scythians apart from what they've left us, which is very, very little because they were nomads and they didn't build. They, they buried people, so we have their burial mounds. But otherwise, no written records. We, we know almost nothing. We don't even know what they called themselves. And, and so out of in that, there's a huge amount of space to play. And, and, and I know Persepolis because I've been to Iran quite often. And it struck me, having read about the Scythians, I went to Persepolis, I saw this thing, and I thought, well, you look at this, th these are all of the tribes that, that uh, Cyrus and Darius claimed, the great Persian emperors claimed that they subjected. And yet there's this one tribe, they're all coming to make offerings and at this spring festival at No Rus. And there's this one tribe that are allowed to carry weapons. And it's like, well, okay, well, why are they allowed to carry our weapons? Well, maybe because in spite of the fact that Darius says he defeated the Scythians, actually, he didn't. And then you look at Herodotus, the great Greek historian, and Herodotus says, yeah, Darius took this army of 700 men across, the, across to fight the Scythians, and the Scythians just kept on moving away. And, and I, mean, I write about this in, in the book. And, and, um, and eventually, the, the Persian army has gone so far, and its, its supply chain is so stretched, that uh, Darius sends a fast herald after, after the king, the Scythian king, and says, why don't you either send me tribute as your lord, or fight? And the Scythian king says, why would we fight? We have no crops we fear you'll burn, and we have no cities we worry that you'll destroy. We're just doing what nomads do. We just keep on moving. We don't need to fight you. And, and the Persians go home, so they never defeat the Scythians. And you know, so these things, yeah, it's a happy coincidence of the fact that I travel around a lot, and I read a lot, and I have a few friends who know more than me. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things we really um, glean from the book is the ability to get a new perspective from other walks of life than just, you know, the pages of history sometimes are full of elite perspectives. Sometimes the stories didn't even, weren't even true and maybe they should have been true or maybe they should not have been true, right? But what we see in these pages here often is your ability to bring out some of the nuances of everyday walk, everyday people, right? Um, and talking about this and then reflecting on that back Right, it's moving backward in through history and trying to bring out the voices. If we think of something like the role of women, right, in nomads, right, you're able to capture some of those voices. I think throughout these pages. Yeah, yeah it's role, role of women is really difficult to recover in in this text because most of the, the things that are written in history about nomads are written by men, and um, and very rarely do you get a glimpse into. I mean, there's one, for instance, a, a Roman. Um, Byz uh, yeah, Byzantine um, ambassador to Attila, the, the Hun, um, 
and he, he's, he's called Priscus, and he is allowed to go and visit um, the, the first wife and, and has an audience with her, and he talks about how, how she has this an e almost equal status to Attila. She, you know, he listens to her advice on, on all matters of state, and you know, this, is, this is an extraordinary insight firsthand. I mean, it's very rare. There isn't enough of that. Yeah. yeah. One of the things you do in this middle part of the book, um, and it, it's demonstrative of the very stellar research that you do, is that you follow in the footsteps of some um, very significant historians and explorers throughout history. Uh, and since the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair theme this year is on Ibn Khaldun, you devote quite a bit, an extensive amount of material um, working through his manuscripts and utilizing him in ways uh, that help you understand his view of history, but in particular also his view of nomadic life. And one of the things, just I'll quickly read, and then you're welcome to reflect on, is um, four questions that he had. And to contextualize it, Ibn Khaldun writes in a world of darkness, which I'll let you explain, right? And he writes these four questions which are model questions, I think, for historians, right? How does the wheel of fortune turn? We'll need to know what that is, right? Um, why do emperors and their empires rise and fall? Is it inevitable? How are people in cities different from those who live in remote places? Why are there some groups of people more powerful than others? And what is, ultimately, what is civilization? And what can we expect from it? Well, yeah, those are big, those are big questions. About six, <laughs> and there's actually six of them there. So, yeah, yeah. And, and, they, and he's got a few more as well, but those are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Ibn Khaldun, I mean, obviously trying to write a history that, that's going to stretch over, over such a huge period of time, 13, uh, 12,000 years, is ridiculous. But Ibn Khaldun was a great um, device for me for holding together this, this central period, partly because he can trace his family back to the beginning of the central period of my book, which is the rise of the, of the Arabs in, in the seventh century and this extraordinary energy, sort of nomadic energy that bursts out of the Arabian Peninsula and conquers the known world or, or much of it. And, um, and, he, and he ends, you know, he's a witness to the last part of this central section that I wanted to write because he actually meets Timur, the great Tamerlane. Um, and, and in between, he, you know, he has this, for, I mean, this is from, from my writer's point of view, he has this theory of, of uh, evolution, um, of the development of man, which perfectly suited my, my case, which is, he describes that there are four states of, of humans, and the, the most basic, and, and he also calls savage, and sometimes even brutish, is the nomad, the person who lives in the desert. Um, but he also calls nomads the wealth, you know, the, 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 the people who create civilization. There's, a, pu there's a, a power in their purity which shapes um, civilization. And remember, this is a man who's writing in the 1300s, the late 1300s. Um, and he's writing in Algeria. He's in exile from the court in Tunis where he has been working as, as, a, as a judge, as a cadi, and as a courtier. And, um, and he's run into difficulties. So, but he's writing with a historical awareness, with a personal historical awareness of the fall of the, of the Arab Empire, because his family had been intricately involved in the rise of the Arab Empire, and in the loss of Al-Andalus, because his family had been grandees in Seville, and, they, and had literally sort of got, ended up as sort of as penniless migrants back in North Africa. And, and he's also, you, you mentioned he's writing in a time of darkness, so it's political darkness, but it's also literal darkness because um, he survives the Black Death, which takes you know, this terrible pandemic which carries off a ridiculous amount of, of the population of Europe and North Africa. I mean, more than 50% of England, for instance, dies in, the, in this pandemic. Um, and uh, Ibn Khaldun loses his friends, members of his family, his teachers, but he survives. And, and so he's in, sitting in a Berber castle in, on the edge of, of the Sahara in Algeria because he's in exile. Uh, he, he, it's not safe for him to be in court anymore. He's brought it's his... It's the Salama 
incidentally, have you visited here? They have reproduced that place where Ibn Khaldun no. sat. No, 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 I must go and have a look. Yes, the castle of Ibn Salam, Abu Salama. And, and, uh, and he goes with his library and his wife and his kids, and he's there for four years or five years or whatever, which is, and he writes this extraordinary work, the, the introduction, and, and which, uh, I, I, by the way, this took me longer. I mean, this man was, was working at great, great speed and, and produced a work that shapes our idea of, of what history is and also shapes, well, creates the subject of sociology. Um, and, and what he's doing is he's sitting there on his own and musing about, about the human condition. And as I said, there are, four, there are four states of man that he talks about. There are nomads, there are, there are herders, uh, he's thinking about Berbers who are living around him, who are not living in, they're not purely nomadic people. Um, there are the farmers, agricultural people, and then there's the people who live in the cities. And in a way, you might think that this is an ascent of man from primitive state in the desert into the cities. But no, not for Ibn Khaldun, because for Ibn Khaldun, it's a problem living in the cities, that all of the good qualities, all of the pure qualities, the power of the community um, and the purity of the leader are eroded in the city and, and empires rise out of the pure state of nomads and they fall because they settle into, this, into a city and the ruler ends up in a palace being separated from his people, he loses touch, he loses his energy and, and they are then refreshed by the next wave of nomads coming out of the desert. And, what Ibn Khaldun does in his writing is trace a, a, a sequence from the, the 7th century up to his own time of the rise and fall of kingdoms and, and empires. And, and, and therefore he champions the, 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 the power of nomads to refresh civilization. And I found this also, Anthony, fascinating because he mentions, of course, that one of the reasons for this force that the nomads brings with them is the sense of asabiyya, uh, which is solidarity, uh, family, cohesion. And then he, dis you discuss in your book how he explains also that as this, uh, these, this tribal structure is urbanized and then develops and then grows and then has more power, uh, it gradually de debases its power base and eventually declines. So it's a cyclical. Uh, but we now, see, we see your, that in our own yeah, time as this well. This is what I wanted to ask you. Did, and you describe all these nomadic empires that started with nomadic force and then gradually became urbanized, became empire, expanded, and then gradually debased their power base and then also collapsed. So what I want to ask is, do you view history equally as a cyclical uh, movement? And two, do you share his ideas about the strength that Asabiya brings with it? Um, well, Ibn Khaldun definitely sees history as a cycle. He doesn't think that things necessarily progress. They don't get better. They go around and around. And, and actually, I think I, I agree with him. I think, you know, we, we are, we're so convinced, we have been so convinced, uh, up until recently, I was so convinced that, that things got better um, among people and things have got better in my life. But actually, I don't think that's the case. And a lot of the things that I thought were, were going to make, make things better have not. I mean, remember when we were told that if we had all had computers, we would have paperless offices. It doesn't, these things don't happen. Um, I mean, which isn't to say we haven't made extraordinary advances in, in science, technology, and other things, but the general sense of, of the human life, has it, has it, is it dramatically better now than it was before? I'm not sure that it is. I think things do go round and round. Um, and, I'm sorry, you're the second part of your question? Do you also believe that uh, Asabiya was Asabiya. an important factor in the consolidation right. of nomadic power as they st went out in order to create their Im amazing empires. It's not only the Arabs who created an empire across the world, but the Huns, the, uh, you know, the Mongols, the Mughals. The so do you think that this is also, was also present in their... Uh I, I think this idea of Asabiya, of, of there being a person, but also an, a person who represents an idea or an ideal around whom everybody can agree to, 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 to stand. Um, is obviously what shapes religions, but has also obviously also shaped um, 
civilization has shaped shaped empires and, and kingdoms. And it and yes, I think it, it's it, it's interesting the way it falls apart in um, in, in when it sort of gets into an urban environment. And, I mean, in in England, we we've had huge trouble of with people who come out of rural communities, and I, I've seen this all, all over the world, and, and that end up in the city, and the connections they had to the people around them who were their support mechanism, in a way, disappears. Um, and that's, the, that's in a sort of very minor and personal way how Asabia falls apart. But every, every, every empire that rises, rises on the, on the, on the back or on the, on, the, on the front of Asabia, and every empire that falls, falls because that sense of, of unity, that, that's common purpose that holds people together, falls apart. And, and it's interesting because in our own time, we've seen, for instance, an American president or an American businessman rise to the presidency through, a, in a way, a sense of Asabia. This, I'm talking about, about Trump, who, who, whose idea was, you know, Washington is a is a is a stinky pit, and I'm going to clean it out. I mean, that was a, that was what he started with, that this simple idea. And around that, everybody thought, yeah, I can stand with that. And everybody's got a complaint about their government, and 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 there he was. Um, the, the extraordinary thing is that somehow his Asabia hasn't quite <laughs> hasn't quite fallen apart. But that might be to do with social media. I don't know. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the defining characteristics of nomads in general. When I think of nomads, I th a lot of words come to mind. One is wanderers, and I think of the wandering spirit that's in many of us, right? Uh, other things that come to mind is uh, songs, dance, movement, trade, exchange, spirituality. Uh, I think of uh, uh, ec 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 economic exchange. I think of many, many different things. Uh -huh. And as an academic, often when we have discussion, I think of pastoralism and the move from hunting gathering. We we have these discussions. Often we we we're, we can't get on the same page on what a nomad is as a definition, right? Um, what would you say? You canvassed and you surveyed and you swept through history uh, a lot of nomadic groups and actually spent time with nomads today. What would you say is the defining characteristic of a nomad traditionally? You need to be herding animals. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You need to be herding animals, and, and you need to be herding animals that need to find pasture. I mean, the, 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 the origin of this word is a very, very, very old Indo-European word that, that refers to a, a patch of land or the right to take your animals onto it to feed. And, um, you know, and, and it, nomads are important for the simple reason that the majority of, of, of our planet is not suited to agriculture, but it is suited to, to seasonal pastoralism, to moving from one place to the other. Like, like as with, um, I mentioned this tribe in Iran, you know, they're on the Mesopotamian plain down near the, down near the Iraqi border in the winter because there's grazing there, and they go up into the mountains in the summer because there's grazing there. They have to move. They have to move up and down. That's that's an obligation, and it's the same with you know with with nomads here. I mean, they, they go you go into the desert into the in the winter because there's more grazing, and you come out onto the edge of the desert in the summer because there's more grazing on the edge of the edge of the desert. And it, it's so you have it, that's fundamental. You've got to have animals, and you've got to have the need to take them from place to place. But with that comes the need to travel light. You need to be able to wrap up everything you have and put it on the back of an animal, animal or a train of, you know, a camel train or whatever, and move it. And you have to have a full understanding and knowledge of the natural world, of the world around you, because you are entirely at its mercy. And that, for me, is, is a nomad. You were influenced by another writer, or explorer, really, um, and that, of course, is... Wilfred Thessinger, right? And um, Zaki and I, when we met, uh, Zeth Thessinger came up, and I know Thessinger has had an impact on both of you. Um, and in a way, I can kind of see uh, a, a bit of a carbon imprint of Thessinger on you, right? He had, he had some impact on, on your writing and on your work. Um, how so? Right? Uh, 
right, in, in the process. And, and I would say he's probably the nomad, quintessentially the nomad explorer of all, right? Yeah, so he, he, uh, he, he, he is. Uh, well, I, I'm, I met, I went and stayed with, with Wilfred Thesiger for a while in Kenya in 1990. We had the same literary agent who thought that it would be good if I wrote a biography of him. Um, but uh, I, I'm not sure that Wilfred would have felt that I was really his, <laughs> going to be his heir because he was very um, physically competitive and gung-ho and, and was very keen for me to go and climb hills and mountains. And, 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 do, and, I, and I just said to him, why would I do that? I mean, I know what the view from the top of the hill is. There's nothing for me there. But I, I went to see him to, to ask him a question because I, I was in my early 30s and I was beginning a, a year where I was traveling around the world. And I, so I, I went to see him first and I said, if you were me starting your life again, what would you do? And he said, I'd stay home, <laughs> which is such a typical Wilfred, Wilfred comment. And I, and I said, no, no, come on. And he said, you know, he thought about it for a while. And he said, I'd go to the Arctic. He said, the Inuit. The Inuit, and I said, I'm not going to the Arctic, <laughs> forget it. But, but he, um, you know, he felt that the world, that he, the things he'd most enjoyed in the world had, had been damaged by the, what he called the curse of the combustion engine. But, uh, but I think in that he was wrong, because the, the other thing he said was the most important thing of all for every, in everything he did was the people and the relationship he had with the people. And I think uh, if he were traveling now, he would have that same, same relation. I, th I think that's still there. Let me tell you about Thesiger, because of course he came out here in the 40s. And he came in order to cross uh, the empty quarter. And in fact, he met Sheikh Zayed in Al Ain when Sheikh Zayed was still a young leader, uh, governor of Al Ain for his brother. And Sheikh Zayed provided him with the two camels that were to carry him, his own camels, on, on purpose, because he knew that wherever he goes inside uh, into the desert, the tribes would re recognize the two camels as those belonging to Sheikh Zayed. And he gave him two of his companions, and the tribes would recognize that these companions are from Sheikh Zayed, and therefore they would not uh, attack him. He came through the... The, the area in the 40s. He met Sheikh Zayed. He wrote, of course, Arabian Sands. And, uh, and he described his meetings with the people and the nomads at the time and his travels with his two nomadic friends. But, uh, and we have an exhibition for his travels and his photographs in Al Ain. And Anthony, I really advise you to come and visit Al Ain because coming to the Emirates without visiting the Oasis and Gilbert knows that uh, fact, uh, for a fact, uh, you wouldn't really have seen it split. But Thesiger came back in the 90s uh, to Abu Dhabi. And that was when his book was translated into Arabic. And I took him to she Sheikh Zayed. And Sheikh Zayed asked him, you know, what, OK, you have been through here in the past, and you have come to us now. What, do you, what, do you, what is the better? What was better for you? And Thesiger told him, well, I will be quite honest, you know, I like, the, I like what it was like. I don't like what it has become. Yeah. And Sheikh Zayed told him, yes, but you know, because you came through as a romantic traveler. You came through, you visited us, you, we sent you through the desert, you came out, then you traveled back to wherever your country was, and you had all the amenities and, and services you needed. But when you came through this area, people died young because we had no medical attention, we had no education, there were no roads, there was no electricity, no water. Today we have provided all of these services, we have built our country, but at the same time we have preserved our heritage and our national soul. And I think this is what I believe is important. Sometimes as travelers, one can become romantic about the situation of Often. places and how it was. It is not always, it was not always easy. But at the same time, I think it's also wrong to believe that because you move into an urban sphere, uh, you lose the, the traditional values 
and the traditional, uh, tra the traditional habits that made you the, the society that you are. And this is why, uh, for Sheikh Zayed, for instance, let, uh, once again, one of the first interviews I had with him, he, t he said he wants to bring modernization into the Emirates because he needs to bring all the amenities of the present. But at the same time, he said, and this was back in 1968, we need to preserve our national identity, our heritage. And this is truly what a tribal structure is about. It's not only about con coming around an idea and a leader, which of course it is, but it is also having those values, those traditions that keep the force of society be, be bonded together. And this is something that is very important for romantic travelers, not always to romanticize about the past and to recognize its hardships as well. Yeah, very nicely put. Uh, uh, Sheikh Zayed had tremendous wisdom, and, and uh, this nomadic wisdom is something I think you bring out among many of the nomadic tribes that you survey in the book. Um, you know, we could have our, you know, in an age of, of, of you know, in, in a world where there are boundaries and walls being built, um, if we could have our politicians in the West read books such as this, what's the big takeaway for them? What, what, what can they learn from your work researching and living with nomadic groups of people? Well, th this, this is a protest book. I mean, it's a protest against um, Brexit, as I, as I wrote some of it, some of it in the UK. Um, it's, it was a protest against Trump's insistence on building a wall, trying to build a wall, which of course he failed a, a, along this, because walls, as, um, as the ancient Romans and the ancient Chinese discovered, do not keep people out. Um, but it's more, it, more than it being a negative thing, it's a positive thing. I wanted to show that the, 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 great, the greatest periods for fertilization of, of, of civilization, the great periods of civilization have happened when the world has had open borders and freedom of, freedom of movement, freedom of conscience, uh, easy and, and obviously most of this is carried on the back of trade and so you need to have open, open trade borders as well and low trade tariffs and I point to the period for instance of the, the, the what is called the Mongol Renaissance which happens before the European Renaissance and, and my argument is that we wouldn't have had a European Renaissance when we had it or in the way we had it if it hadn't been for the Mongols who showed what you can do by opening borders and allowing, it didn't matter whether you were a Muslim or a Christian or a animist or whatever, it, it didn't matter. Um, they believed in, in, in uh, the, and they also had extremely low trade tariffs, which made it very attractive for people to come and to go, to go across the, this whole of, ce of central Eurasia to, to trade. And out of that came the European Renaissance and out of that came extraordinary advances in technology, in, in, or in all fields of life. And, and so the takeaway of, 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 of my book, I hope, is, is that, it, well, two things. One is that, that, that out, of, out, of op out of welcoming strangers, out of opening your borders, out of going and talking to people, comes an exchange of ideas that may well change the world. And the other is that you can't be a nomad without being absolutely aware of the impact you have on, your, on the natural world around you. And I think we all need to be doing that as well. Which was a very important perspective, and uh, we really admire the way you have been able to convey that in such an absorbing historical but travel uh, story way. But I want to ask you something that intrigued me, because in your book you almost hinted that we have a gene, you know, there is a genetic drive uh, in uh, us uh, in order to be nomads, that something drives us. Uh, how do you explain this, and uh, well, what can you tell us more about well, it? Well, this is, uh, thank you for mentioning that. This is based on, on research um, that came out of Northwestern University in the United States, um, where um, they were looking at um, genetic variants in a tribe of nomads in East Africa, the Arial, who are a part of the subsect of the Rendile tribe. And what they discovered was there was one variant gene that successful nomads, because not all nomads are as successful as but the ones who had the biggest herds, who were, you know, who had the biggest families, who were 
who were able to feed more people, um, had this variant gene. And they found the same variant gene in children in the United States who were diagnosed with learning difficulties, with ADHD. And the suggestion um, is that, that these children and, uh, and don't have learning difficulties. So what it, they, they simply haven't rewired in, in the way that, that some of us have. That 12,000 years ago, we all had to know how to live on the move, which meant um, you know, not living in four walls and not knowing what's going to happen next and being much more flexible in our thinking. And, and our educational system in, encourages us to have a, one answer to any question. One plus one equals two. But it might not be two, it might be four if you're thinking about halves. You can have four halves. It might, you know, that, that simply the, the mind that, that makes successful nomads might not make for a happy child in a classroom. And um, the implication behind that is if you took the child out of the classroom and put it into a different environment, that it might flourish. And there's a, a group, I was mentioning this to you, William, before, who've reached out to me um, since my book came out called the Octopus Movement, who are a group of people who are now adults running corporations and all sorts of other things, but who were diagnosed with learning dis difficulties when they were children. And they've read this passage in my book and, and want me to go and talk to them because they think, you know, finally, this is the answer. And, and, you know, but not just them, but I mean, I mentioned David Bowie, the, the musician in this, I mean, who famously had a really bad time at school, but who you could, ha would have to say uh, had an extremely successful career. And he said when he was at school, his mind was always wandering off. He was always thinking, and he never had the answer because there was always lots of answers. And um, so that's the nomadic gene in a way. Um, it would be it would be interesting to know, you know, yes. Yeah, I mean, maybe one day we'll all be able to do this test to see if we have the nomadic gene. I don't think I do. I mean, I travel around a lot, but one of the essentials of being a nomad is to travel lightly, and I I always have too many books. I um, want to thank you, Anthony. It's this is a privilege to have you here, and I would like to open. Uh, our discussion up over to you, um, our audience. If somebody has a question that they would like to act, ask Anthony, uh, please feel free and raise your hand. Sure. The microphone, the microphone is coming. coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this beautiful session, first of all. Uh, first, there is something I've noticed from my humble uh, readings that the way uh, expats, foreigners, uh, Westerners write about nomads is different from the way we write about them, Arabs, especially even the nomads themselves. There's an eye for details that they have that sometimes uh, we don't. Um, there are things we take for granted as nomads or Bedouins, uh, because like we say in Arabic, musallamat, uh, they are part of our daily life but they have an eye for it, and they mention it, and the way they describe it is so beautiful. Uh, and on that, um, I will base my question uh, for both of you. Uh, who did the nomads justice in terms of authors uh, or books, history, or nowadays, nowadays uh, writings? Who did them justice? Who was able to reflect uh, or give us a reflection of the way they lived, their culture, everything. And this is all my question. Great question. Do you want to answer that? No, you are. <laughs> OK. It's a really good question. Um, well, I'll start, I'll start in, in antiquity. Uh, there are two historians I write about, um, Herodotus, the Greek historian from 400 BC, and, and the grand historian of China, who, both of whom write about um, the nomads who are troubling their worlds. And, and I think they, they write about them, I mean, there's some prejudice in, in what they write, but there's, there's some also some fabulous details. And, um, but I, would, I was thinking, um, this, in, in 1750, when the first English dictionary was being compiled, the word nomad was not included because it was entirely irrelevant. Nobody, it wasn't a word that anybody used in England 250 years ago. And, and so maybe we are um, 
we who come from, from the West and maybe particularly from England have a romantic streak because it, it's, in, it, it's for so long has been entirely unknown to us, this idea of, of nomadism. And, um, but I think there are a lot, of, a lot of writers in the last 50 years who've written, I mean, starting with Wilfred Thesiger, but who've written, who've written very well, uh, uh, very well about nomads. And now there's, there's, there are all sorts of academics who are doing serious on the ground research um, into Central Asian uh, nomads, for instance. I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of really good work being done in, in academia. Maybe you, could, maybe you know some of the, some of the new academic work. Not, not necessarily offhand, but uh, I think you answered that quite well. So um, yeah, no, no, no worries. I, I think uh, I think that's uh, uh, your your very definition when you tie it to um, adaptation to the environment is especially I think very key and important. Right, it's the ability to adapt to the environment, uh, even develop ways of technology. You think about something uh, as basic here as the domestication of the camel, but that aspect itself is revolutionary, right? Um, for, for someone to be on the move. Right? Yes. Um, to have a beast, to domesticate a beast of burden, to tame an, uh, a camel, right? And to be utterly devoted to that craft in, in and of itself. Well, and, and more, so the, more than the camel, I, I would say even the horse, which was also domesticated by nomads and, and was the most successful form of transport humans have ever had. I mean, uh, you know, the New York Fire Brigade was still using horses at the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it went on. Um, I have a question for Zaki and for um, Anthony. Amazing, uh, amazing insight into so many things I'd never heard of. But what is it about the simplicity of a nomadic life where you own nothing, you carry only bare essentials that make it such a sort of um, a dreamlike existence in today's world where our planet is suffering from all our materialism. So a question to Your Excellency and to Anthony. S sorry, again. The so the, the, I'm saying the nomadic lifestyle where everything that you have, you have to carry with you and it's essential to life but you also have great respect for the natural environment you live in. You don't destroy it. That compared to lifestyle today, which is destroying our planet at a terrifying speed, how can we return to be more nomadic without the gene? Well, I mean, that's a very good question. And let me start by saying, incidentally, that nomadic life did not only mean moving with your herds, and of course it was, uh, and go, but it also, especially in this region, it included also doing other things. You had to be multifunctional. So you went to the, uh, to the dates in to have to harvest your dates. You went to the sea in order to work with the fisheries. So it was a multifunctional life. Uh, the respect for nature came naturally to them uh, because they believed not only they should preserve what nature is giving them, for their own sustenance, but that we should preserve it also for the next generations. And this is what made, for instance, uh, Sheikh Zayed from the very early days keen on making sure that the environment is respected as we move into rapid urban development. And he had many sayings where he said that we need to preserve our natural resources for the future generations, not only for today. Now, what has happened since, and I think Anthony brings this out in his book with, from Bacon onward, when uh, the, 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 there were different notions about how do you deal with nature, one of living with nature and respecting nature and making sure that you uh, respond to its needs, to one where you went out in order to control it. Yes, he, Bacon, Bacon, who's the and English... And I will English leave it now to Anthony to continue. Yes, Bacon, who's the English philosopher of the early 1600s, talks about the dominion over nature that, that he and, and his people believed was their right given by God, dominion over nature. And a good thing came out of it, which was a, a need to study nature so everything, every, every plant, every, every rock, everything had to be understood. So out of that comes the age of reason and the age of enlightenment. But the, the 
flip side and the downside of it is this idea, therefore we don't have to look after it, which is clearly mad and, 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 you know, and has led us, as you say, to where we are now. But I think uh, alongside this idea of the respect for, for the natural world, which is absolutely essential now and, and in answer to your question, is also a sense of community. Um, you know, the, 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 it's one of the other essential qualities of a nomadic community was that ability to sit around, it was very often a fire, um, and, and tell stories, and, and which not only kept the past alive and rooted, therefore rooted you in the past. So but, there are, but, so, I'll just say, but, was all, but was also a way of holding the community together and, and, and having a very clear sense of identity. And I think that, um, that is, is something that, that can be recovered. And this is why I believe it's important to make sure that one re maintains the values uh, we can call them nomadic values, we may call them tribal values, we may call them asabiyya, as Ibn Khaldun called them, but to make sure that these values live with us as we move into rapid urbanization. And I was telling Anthony the other day the story, I told it actually when he came through here 15, 20 years ago. But, but when the Louvre was just an idea, when, when the it was Louvre still water. was just an idea, I told him the story about the first man on the moon uh, Sheikh when Sheikh Zayed was watching this in uh, Malaga in Spain yes. and, uh, and, and, he, and his companions were watching it as well and they all said, no, this can never happen. You can never go into this, the seven heavens. And uh, Sheikh Zayed, and of course, uh, one of his uh, companions was one of the, was one of the chief a tribal uh, nomadic tribes, the, the Manasir. And Sheikh Zayed told them, no, everything is the will of God, and through the will of God, man can be able, you know, can go out into the, into the heavens. And of course, yet the, today, we were talking in Al Ain University with our astronaut, our second astronaut, Nayadi, who is right now in the space station. But the first astronaut to go into the he heavens it's was a Mansouri. Yes. Yes. So this tells you how a, a nomadic spirit can That's even so drive us out in order to go and explore space. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, uh, Tatsigar, when he came in the 90s to UAE, I invited him. Uh, uh, for lunch in my house where we served him Bedouin food. And I saw him also uh, after a few days with his publisher, Motivate. And uh, when I talked with him, my remarks were exactly like Sheikh Zaid remarks. Because I remember my mother used to tell me that two of her sisters died during childbirth and they had no way of saving them. And many of her young relatives died. And when I asked her, how did they die? She said, well, they, they died. They went to wake them up and they died. I mean, they died because of heart problems or something like this. But at that time, medicine was not, uh, you know, the services were not developed in UAE. Uh, this is only part of it. I mean, the other, the hardship and things, I witnessed part of it also when I was young. So it wasn't that uh, romantic, the, this Bedouin life and things. Uh, there, uh, there was uh, warfare, there was uh, robbers, uh, uh, there were all kinds of things. Anyway, but the thing which made me uh, yani a little bit uh, have my uh, reserve about Thessigar is that when he told me that he have no musical ear, that he couldn't appreciate Mozart and Bach and Beethoven and all those greats. And I said, what? For me, a Bedouin, I appreciate all this great work of human creativity. And you from England, who were born in that, and you cannot appreciate this great wealth? Ma'as <laughs> salama. Um, 
all three of us agreed in our conversations that we're lovers of books. And if you were with us in the back in the green room, you would have heard us talking, each of us talking about our libraries. Uh, this book is a welcome addition in any library. And so, Anthony, you have, you have the final word here. Um, where do we go from here? Um, after reading Nomads, what's next for us? What's next for, for the world? Well, the, the, easy, the easy answer is my next book. <laughs> but uh, well, where's next for the world? Well, I do think, you know, I, I, I do think that the issues that I, that I grapple with in this book are, are not going to go away today. So I think, I think, you know, assuming everybody goes away with a copy of the book and, and reads it, then we would have dropped a little pebble in a pond here and, and began to make changes. And, and that would be a good thing. That's where we go. And, Perfect. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll make sure. Yeah. Oh, and, and so, okay. yeah, I want to thank you, Anthony. Uh, Anthony Satin, everyone. Uh, Nomads thank 2022. You uh, thank you to um, Your Excellency Zaki as well. Uh, and uh, Anthony will be over to the left for a book signing. Uh, so please join us. And if you have any questions as well, uh, he'll be there signing your book. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank the session. You.